lovely Friday afternoon here in Zoo where I live. I hope you're having gorgeous weather out where you are too. And we are going to start off our Friday's webinar with Mr. Mike Mayer in South London. And I'm so excited to have Mike here with us because he's just our superstar global scale of English director. And what he doesn't know about scaling and scaffolding isn't worth knowing. So I'm just going to pass on over to Mike and go for it. Okay, thanks, Mary. Not quite sure how I follow on from that introduction, but uh, a <laughs> uh, good, uh, I guess, afternoon. Yep, yeah, it's even afternoon here. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining this session. Um, as Mary said, I am coming to you from South London, where um, we are still in lockdown. But um, as I've said on each of these presentations, we celebrate small wins. And the small win is it's not raining for that walk that we're allowed to do later. So we are holding on to that. Um, I know that Mary and Lena have done quite a bit of promotion of Global Scale of English in Switzerland. And um, I know one name on this call, at least, who I know knows a lot about the Global Scale of English. So I hope I'm going to be able to tell you something uh, you don't know. Um, but I'm not going to assume that everybody is super familiar with it. So I will just do a quick overview and then show you maybe some of the things that you don't know. And then something that I'm pretty sure you won't know because it's very new. So. Um, I obviously I work with Pearson and I've been working on the global scale of English now for about eight years. Um, and when we started off on this project, um, we were trying to address really some of the limitations that had been leveled against the common European framework. Obviously, the common European framework is the most widely used framework for language learning, uh, no longer only in Europe, but around the world. So increasingly in Asia, Middle East, Latin America, ministries of education are setting common European framework targets for their high school and their university um, exit levels. And you have to feel sorry for those teachers, especially in Asia, where they've been landed with these common European framework references, and they know nothing about the common European framework, and it's all really a foreign language to them. And so really, we very much had these teachers who are maybe not quite as experienced in mind as we were developing out the global scale of English, because we really wanted to make something that was practical to support teachers in their lesson planning, their curriculum development, and in their assessment of learners. So, if you like, we took the Council of Europe at their word. So in the uh, Common European Framework Manual, the introduction says, you know, teachers, publishers, ministries should take this information and adapt it and extend it to fit your particular circumstances. And so as a publisher, we had a few problems in implementing the global scale of English. So we wanted to extend it, extend it with more can-do statements, particularly at the lower levels, particularly for writing, listening and reading, because two thirds of the information in common European framework is, a, is for speaking, which is fine, but we publish four skills courses and most teachers are teaching all four skills. And then we do a lot of publishing for English for academic purposes, for English for business um, and teaching English to young learners. So common European framework was never developed for young learners. So we wanted to um, build out a set of can-do statements that were appropriate for the learning context of, of um, a child in primary and lower secondary education. So that's what we've done. You can see the PDFs on the screen there, four different sets of learning objectives to support learning, teaching and assessment in different uh, domains of English language, le English language learning. Yeah, that's a key difference with the Common European Framework. The global scale of English, as the title suggests, is specific to English um, as opposed to other languages. And at the same time, global scale of English is also a proficiency scale. So it's a numerical scale 
which is completely aligned to the common European framework and enables us to measure proficiency within a common European framework level. So as teachers, I'm sure you're all too aware that those common European framework levels, particularly when you get to the B levels, students can be there for you know, many, 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 many hours and indeed years. If we go back to Asia, you are going to be at B1 for years. And this can be quite demotivating uh, for learners because they're taking exams, um, which are telling them they're B1 every year. And you have a sense then that you're not making any progress, but of course, you're not the same B1. And so with this numerical scale, we can actually show progress that's being made within a common European framework level. And then, as I said at the beginning, we really wanted to develop um, a number of resources to support teachers. And the key word that you can see on the screen there is free. And yes, everything I will show you today is free. And no, we will never start charging you for it. We're not sucking you in with a free offering and then we'll say, oh, thank you. You've been using it. And now we want you to pay $5 a month or whatever. This will never happen. And one of the reasons why this will never happen, other than the goodness of our heart, is that we have signed legal contracts with the Council of Europe to say that given that we're including common European framework in our work, this will always remain open source. We will never gate access to this information. And so at Pearson, the uh, global scale of English learning objectives are used to inform all of our content creation. So that all the ELT courses that we now sell, they've all been built on the global scale of English learning objectives, which enables us to create content with a lot more rigor than maybe happened in the past. We're able to track skills development across courseware um, using these very specific learning objectives. And then we have an increasing number of assessments, which we won't go into today, but which report out on the global scale of English proficiency scale, 10 to 90, and they will be different assessments for placing students, for measuring progress within um, uh, an academic year, and then the higher stakes creditation assessments as well. So why should you take my word for the fact that this is a, a really valid, good framework to be using? Well, you know, I'm very trustworthy, but you shouldn't take the word of external to Pearson organizations. And of course, the key one is the Council of Europe. So we work very closely with the Council of Europe. Um, Brian North, who is the creator of the, one of the creators of the Common European Framework is one of our advisors. And um, I would say one of the greatest achievements in my time at Pearson, and certainly one of my proudest legacies will be the fact that the work that we've done here has actually been included in the updated Common European Framework Companion Volume. So around 50 of our learning objectives have been included in the Common European Framework, which I think shows how um, how the Council of Europe recognised the rigour of the academic study that's gone into um, the work that we've done. And then other organisations thinking about quality control. So I'm sure you're very familiar with Equals and you may well have heard of NIAS and Asset. These are quality assurance organisations which will go into an, an institution and accredit them to say that they are providing quality language training. In the past, they included Common European Framework as a globally recognized standard that if you were using that standard, that would help you meet some of the criteria. They have now included Global Scale of English to, the, to those criteria. So if you're using Global Scale of English, if you can demonstrate that your curriculum is built on Global Scale of English learning objectives, then that will go towards your equals NIAS and asset accreditation. And thinking about the learning objectives, um, I've put a few ideas there of how learning objectives are used by teachers around the world. There is no right and wrong answer. Um, 
in, a, in an attempt to make this a little bit interactive, if you want to just type into the chat box, I've got chat open on my uh, phone, I can see how you yourself are using learning objectives. And you do have the option of I'm not, non, F or something else, G. But if you just want to type in a letter, and I can get a sense of how people might be using learning objectives in their teaching. Um, seeing Mary hot off the hot off. Okay, A C D E A C D E A C D E A and C C A B C E. Okay, great. As I said, there are no right and wrong answers, and actually, all of the above are completely valid. And we've got teachers around the world using for each of these. Um, and I particularly like the fact that most people there who replied said C, sharing them with learners. And there is a certain amount of research out there that shows that sharing the learning objectives with learners actually has a positive impact on them being able to achieve that particular, uh, master that particular learning objective and language function. And you probably noticed in course books, increasingly these learning objectives are now included students may well miss that information but we do include it so that there's an opportunity to call out you know this is why we're doing this this is what you'll be able to do by the end of the lesson this is the uh, granular objective so we have the pdfs that i showed on a previous slide that you can download from the um, website we will give you the website very easy to remember english.com slash gse you can find everything on that website, Website, as I said, all free of charge. Um, but for me, the tool that really is the thing to be using is this GSE teacher toolkit. And the reason why I think this is better than the PDFs, it's because it's a database, so it's searchable, so it can speed up um, finding the appropriate learning objectives that you want. And in addition to the learning objectives, We've also run projects to align grammar to the Common European Framework and Global Scale of English and vocabulary also aligned to Common European Framework and the Global Scale of English. Um, and the search options, you know, you go into learning objectives, select your learner, you can select a language skill and limit the proficiency levels of your learner on that sliding scale you can see there to help identify appropriate learning objectives for a particular learner. I just wanted to call out a couple of other search functionalities that you might not be aware of. So within a business, uh, the professional English uh, learning objectives, we have carried out a project to identify which language skills are most relevant for particular jobs. So we took an online database of jobs um, it's called ONET, again, freely, freely available if anybody wants to uh, take a look at that. And for each of those, uh, for each job family, if you like, they identify all the possible jobs within that um, career area. And for each job, they identify the tasks that you will be expected to carry out as part of doing that job. Now, some of these tasks are manual. They require no language, but most of them there is, if you're doing this in English, there are some language skills that you will need to be able to carry out those tasks in English. So we took those tasks and then we've aligned them to global scale of English learning objectives. It's not rocket science, it's not super complicated, but it is quite time consuming and it takes a lot of resource. Um, and so we know that teachers don't really have all that time to do that. And if you were in a very, uh, I guess, rich organization and you could afford to run a needs analysis with your group of nurses before they started, perfect. But most people are not in that position. They don't have the luxury of the, that money, those resources. And so what this uh, search functionality does, if you've got your group of nurses, you can look here and it will bring up the learning objectives which have been identified as being most relevant to the nursing profession. Very often for ESP, these English for Specific Purposes courses, 
you only have a group of nurses for a short time. It might be 10 weeks, 20 weeks. You can't teach them everything in that period. So this gives teachers um, an indication of, OK, you're going to get a good return on your investment of time if you teach these things, because we know that nurses are going to need to have these language skills in their job. And like all of the work that we do, we don't just it's not just desk work. We go out and we validate the work. And in this case, we validated it, validated it with uh, teachers of um, the, the particular um, pr profession. So people who teach accounting and finance, people who teach healthcare, they've gone through and validated that actually, yes, they agree. These are the language functions that um, they would teach to those particular professions. Um, and then quickly in the academic English, I just want to use this as a, a way to illustrate something that a bit broader about the global scale of English. So I said we wanted to extend out the common European framework into different domains. And if you are creating a writing course for academic English and you turn to the common European framework and your students are at a B1, B1 plus level, that is the information you will find. That is the only learning objective, the only can-do statement that relates in any way to academic writing. So if you have to create your course, it's not an awful lot of information to, to help you there. Whereas if you go to the Global Scale of English academic uh, learning objectives, you'll find much more information within, uh, within the, the B1, B1 plus level. And then using this to illustrate something else, which is kind of different from the common European framework, you'll see that where possible, and when I say where possible, I mean where we have had good data from our analysis, we have included scaffolding into the learning objectives. And this enables us to be able to give a student credit for being able to do something with support. We don't have to wait until they can do it independently before we can give them credit for having mastered a particular learning objective. So you can see the scaffolding here is at a, a B1 of 50. And then when you get to a higher level, almost to a B2, you would expect them to be able to do it independently. You won't find this for every language function, but we have tried to include this wherever possible to have more, if you like, accessible moments. So we know if they can do it with support, they're around this uh, 50 mark uh, on the GSE. And academic skills like business skills, you can search rather than reading, listening, speaking, writing, you can search for particular academic strategies or academic discourse or, you know, composition, et cetera. Um, as I said before, we've also included grammar and vocabulary. Now, grammar, Will you find anything radically different in grammar? No, there is, I think you probably have all realized this, a pretty much tried and tested grammar syllabus for every adult course ever published. Grammar points tend to be taught in a particular order. And so the grammar database is not going to completely rock your world. However, what is nice in there, if we look at the learning objectives, We've added links to grammar that you may have to teach to give learners a chance of being able to master that particular language function. So you'll find that in the speaking and the writing learning objectives, the productive skills. And then in the grammar database, from the point of the grammar, we link back to functional can-do statements. So if you're teaching a point of grammar, you can get suggestions for and you can contextualize this in this more realistic language function. So that's just something that might be useful for, for lesson planning and, and development. Um, uh, have we got time for this? Well, very quickly, which of these words would you teach at A2? I've got uh, six words from like the environment topic area. If you had to teach, any of these are A2, which would you? It's not a trick question, and I don't really think there's a right and a wrong answer. So Mary would teach litter. 
you are allowed to teach more than one word. I'm not I'm saying you have to teach just one. A, C, D, E, F, F, D, C, D, F. Okay, so you can probably see behind me a beautiful array of dictionaries. And before I joined Global Scale of English, I was a lexicographer. So I joined Pearson to head up the Longman Dictionary range. So vocabulary has been a passion of mine for many, many years. And what I think is great about the GSE vocabulary is that it's like an online dictionary. I think I mentioned it was free, right? It's a free online dictionary but it's divided by topic. So you can do searches in a topic area. So this was environment. And then it will bring you up all the words that have been tagged for environment and order them from the lowest level to the highest level. And the way in which we added the level, we worked out the leveling, was we combined frequency in the language, so corpus frequency, with teacher ratings of how useful a particular word was in language learning. So we've got corpus and teacher ratings for 36,000 words and phrases. Crunch that data, set it against models of how many words and items learners know at different levels of proficiency, and we've got this ordering. Now, as a lexicographer, do I think we can say pollution is a B1 word? I find that difficult to say. <laughs> um, it's a stretch. And if you need to teach pollution at A2, you teach pollution at A2. It's a noun. What's going to go wrong? The way in which I think you should use this database is if you call up the topic, you can see the ordering of from the easiest to the most difficult. And if you're looking to introduce new items in a particular topic area, there is a temptation sometimes to introduce like random words, which you know they won't know, but are probably ranked at like C2. This will give you inspiration for words that are maybe at just at the next level of proficiency to the learners. They may already know a lot of the words, in which case you go to the ones that you think are not, then they won't be known, but maybe they're still quite frequent and still quite useful without going for those random words at C2. That's how I would use this database. And then for your information, uh, you can see that, you know, the assumption would be they already knew power, but maybe energy is the beginning of A2, they might already know that. So maybe then you would move up to teaching them pollution and litter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, texts, if you are, as I know I did when I was a teacher, and I'm, but <clears throat> when I was a teacher, we didn't have the internet. So I used to have to photocopy newspaper articles, but I'm sure now it's much quicker and you go onto the internet and you can find topical news and information, uh, as a text to use with your students to, you know, because it's topical, it will engage them a bit more than maybe what's in the course book. How do you decide on the proficiency level of the text? Which of those things do you look at? Again, you can just type a little letter into the uh, chat box. Do you look at the topic, the vocabulary, the grammar, the length, the sentence complexity, all of these? Is it a gut feeling because you've been teaching so long so that you know what a B1 text is like? Um, they are just some of the things that, you know, teachers generally look at. And again, if it's F and you're going with gut feeling and you've got 20 years experience, fine. Think about that poor Asian teacher who has just been saying, OK, you're teaching A2. What is an A2 level text? It's quite difficult. So we've added um, a text analyzer and this uses the artificial intelligence uh, expertise that we have in Pearson based in the US. These are the this is the team that has worked on many of the assessment products to do the automated scoring of speaking and writing. So they brought that expertise into this text analyzer. And what this text analyzer will do is you paste in your text and give it a title. 
there you go you click analyze the text and the text goes away and analyzes many of those things that were in the list before so the complexity of the sentences the level of the vocabulary the level of the grammar the the, the length of the text and it will come back with a suggested level for this text so this is appropriate at this level and then it will highlight some words that it thinks might be above the level of the text this is automated okay those highlighted words are for you to look at and think now they know that word no 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 um, that's fine this is just to give you some suggestions of words that maybe might be a little bit too difficult and then if it is a bit too high you can go in edit it shorten the sentences simplify the vocabulary and i managed to get this down a few a few points on the gse so again it's a support it will help you confirm confirm your suspicions confirm your gut feeling and give you some support in uh, finding texts which are relevant to use with with your learners and with that i will stop sharing mary is going to now show you something which also draws on the gse learning objectives mary over to you well, thank you, Mike. How cool. How cool is that that we know a lexicographer? I mean, <laughs> I just think that is so exciting. I just can imagine lexicographer, lexicographers like Mike down in the Bodleian Library, wandering around, finding words and like, ah, oh, I think it's just the coolest thing ever. Okay, so excuse me for going all fangirl on lexicographers here. All right, so thank you for your session. And now I'm going to go on with that and share my screen and show what all of Mike's hard work has done. And it allows us to, um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen now? Can somebody yell yes? Yes. Oh, no. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay. So all of the work that Mike and his team have done done have ha, allows us to develop all of our courseware and a lot of the digital materials that go along with it. Okay, so this is all very scientifically developed and working with our artificial intelligence team and what we have now added using the global scale of English and learning objectives, we have now added to a various course materials that we have, including roadmap, which Imogen Wiley will be um, showing us a little bit later. Test, uh, we have our test generator for the teachers on certain of our products, okay? We also have our normal test prep within the course where it's set, but this is a brand new tool. So I'm just gonna show you a very little introduction to it. So when you go into your Pearson English portal, I think most of you here with us today, you have seen it through me somehow, somewhere. Okay, now in the English portal in your teacher's account, you can go in and look under products. And here we have Gandalf the teacher. And in his product, he says, I want to create a special test for my students. So I'll go into the test generator. Now, again, based on the global scale of English and the learning objectives, we are able to put this test generator at every single level of the courseware. So a lot of our courses now have eight different levels. And this one specifically here, I think it's a roadmap test that I was working on at a B1 plus level. And so when I want to create a test, and this is specifically an online test, but you can also see that you could print this out as a paper test. All right, so when we create this test, we have select activities, test timing, select students, and add instructions. Now, what's lovely about this is that a lot of teachers tell me, especially when we're talking about state school, Berufsschule, or Escuela Media, or gymnasiums, when they want to do tests with students, they're a little bit nervous that the, the students might share the test with each other. But here you could randomize the test and give tests individually to each student. All right. So you've chosen unit one, unit two, and now you get to choose different activities that you would like to add onto the test. So this again is where you can randomize things and make the test different for each and every student if you so choose. These are just a couple of the activities that we have. Listening multiple choice, listening classify, grammar fill in the blanks, vocabulary fill in the blanks. We have a wide variety of activities for the tests and these are just a couple. 
All right, so this is what one looks like, vocabulary fill in the blanks close. So the students are requested to complete the text with words and phrases, and then their answers will be at the bottom of the screen, and they drag and drop and put the answers into the test. All right, now here we have the test content. So I've just shown you one activity that you can put into the test. And here I'm just showing you that you can randomize order of the test items for different students. Again, this is very scientific, very artificial intelligent based on the learning objectives, but still you can have very personalized tests for each and every student in your class. All right, now to look at it a little from the student's perspective, the students can go into their class, and this one's called Scully's Holly Roadmap B1+, and they can see that they have an assignment due. Again, I'm just showing you what this looks like to help you set it up when you want to do this yourselves. We can do individual training sessions for you. All right, so Scully's Holly, and I have my two students there, and Gandalf the Wonder, he's already done a ton of uh, his test, and I see that Gandalf the student needs to do that, so I remind him to do this, okay? And then the students can also see that the, how their progress is doing. I, the teacher, can see this as well as the students can see their progress, the average score, the amount of times they've spent, the amount of time they spent doing it, um, what they've completed, what is pending, etc. So this is really helping the teacher be the guide on the side. Now, if we go over here, we can even see at a granular level, again, this is where all of the work that Mike and his team is, have been doing on the learning objectives and also our artificial intelligence team, we can go even within each unit, um, see what the students have been doing on their uh, assessment, their test generator. Right. Now here, the students themselves can also see their progress. So here, Gandalf the Caramel, Caramel can see that he's done nothing. Goodness gracious me, as Legic used to say to me all the time, right? He needs to do a little bit more, but he can see the vocabulary, grammar, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Again, this really refers back to the Global School of English and Learning Objectives, so the students really can target what they are working on. And I've been told by Ministry of Education in Switzerland that this is really a motivating factor within the Pearson courseware. All right, and then again, from the student's perspective and their student account, they can see the assignments that they need to do. Here is the test generator test that they have to open. All right, and their first task, and they're instructed to enjoy this test, they get to start. And this is what they can do, fill in the listening. They have filled in the listening, and then also in certain activities, you can have tips or check the sample answer. They submit their activity and they get instant feedback. And again, this, they can do this activity as many times as the teacher has set up the test generator for. Here's another view for the students. Score one attempt of one. Another activity, and hopefully maybe this time Gandalf has done a little bit better. Submitted the activity, gone to the next part of the test. And this time, he's got 100%. Again, very motivating, and he can see where he needs to work on. All right, again, first attempt, last attempt, overall average score, and then scores by skills, and the averages are based on the activities submitted. Right now here, as the teacher, I can see now both of my students have done everything that they need to do. And the class performance Again, so although you're teaching a full class, you can also view it as an individual um, guide to focus on certain students who need a bit extra, a bit more help here. Okay, so in brief, that is the test generator. And it really is to emphasize the whole global scale of English, learning objectives, and the artificial intelligence that underpins everything that Pearson is doing, has been doing, and now it's all coming together to move forward to our incredible offering that we have for both online face-to-face -face and hybrid classes. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Okay, so are there any questions that you might have for Mike or for me or for, I don't know who else. <laughs> Looking into the chat here.
Okay, Mike, do you have any last um, comments to say? Uh, just did we give the website? I think we did, yes. That's in the chat, yeah, english.com slash GSE. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you go to english.com, that has now become a different portal. So you have to put the slash GSE. Otherwise, it's now pearson.com slash GSE. But english.com will take you to something very different. So don't do that. Always put the slash GSE in. Yep. And uh, just thank you um, for taking the time out to come and listen. And yeah, hopefully one day I will be there in person. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, Mike, that would be so, <laughs> so great because now I've just had to send Mike all of our little presents via, I don't know, have you got it yet, Mike? <laughs> Has it <laughs> Not yet, no. No. 2 30 apparently between 2 30 and 3 30 it says i'm having a delivery today oh, so it's the highlight of my week it's very exciting yeah <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much mike for doing this um series of oh. webinars um this month and uh, i wish you a lovely afternoon and for the rest yep. of us please feel free to stay on with us we're going to continue on in about 10 minutes with imogen wiley on a roadmap, um, and then after Imogen Wiley, we'll have Joe Hunter showing us our really exciting new exams course formula. And Mike, you go and enjoy whatever you're doing, and uh, and get that package in the freezer or refrigerator quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Enjoy bye the rest bye. of the day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.